morning. We give you a very warm welcome to this service of worship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we welcome all who are in the building and those who may be watching online as well. And we do pray that the mighty Lord who reigns in time and eternity will bless us as we worship him together. With our pastor, Professor Peter Kernley, preaching and teaching in South Africa this week, our preacher today is the Reverend Dr. Tim Donaghy. Dr. Donaghy is a retired Reformed Presbyterian minister who has served the Lord in Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, Scotland, and Peru. So Tim, you and Marjorie are very welcome. It's good to have you with us today, and thank you for taking the services. Announcements, God willing, are posted on the Congregational WhatsApp group as are updated prayer points. And just in relation to prayer points, uh, there are some prayer points for the camps, and those are available in the vestibule, so please feel free to take those and to use them. Again, a reminder that we're moving into the summer period. There's no midweek meetings, no Sabbath school over July and August. The congregational prayer meetings will continue as usual on the first and third Sabbath evenings uh, over July and August. The session thanks everyone involved in serving in the Holiday Bible Club over the past week. It was led so ably by James Gillespie and David Drennan, and it was indeed a great joy to see so many children and families attend. It was also a great encouragement to witness the large number from the congregation who worked together so effectively and so harmoniously before and during the week, and we praise God for that. Please continue to pray for the work of the club and for the sowing of the good seed of the word that it will get, bring forth a harvest in the lives of all those who were there. And finally, as a congregation, we want to assure Ms. Sharon Clark, our fiancé, David Mathis, the Clark and Mathis families, of our love and prayerful best wishes as Sharon and David are married, God willing, this Thursday. May the one who designed and ordained marriage grant his abundant blessing on Sharon and David, not only for their wedding day, but for their marriage. So these are all the announcements. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome. It's good to be here. Uh, I think it was over 30 years since I was here before, so uh, it's a long time ago, but it's good to be here. Our call to worship comes from Jeremiah chapter 10. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great. Your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your due, for among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. And we come to worship this great and almighty God. And we sing praise from Psalm number nine. We sing the first verse and then verses four to six. The tune is Sankey 297. Psalm number nine, the first verse. Wholehearted thanksgiving to you I will bring in praise of your marvelous works I will sing. For joy I will shout and exultingly cry in praise of your name, Lord my God, O Most High. And then we move on down to verse four. The Lord will eternally reign from his throne. He has it established for justice alone. He righteously judges the world in his sight. All peoples will know that his judgment is right. The Lord is a stronghold, a refuge, a tower for all the oppressed in their dark, troubled hour. Those knowing your name, Lord, trust you for your grace. You have not forsaken those seeking your face. Sing praise to the Lord, who in Zion does dwell, among all the peoples, his mighty deeds tell. The cry of the poor never fades from his ear. Their blood he avenges, he always will hear. We sing these verses, and the tune is 297. Let's join together and sing praise to God. <laughs>
Let us come before God in prayer. Eternal and ever-blessed God, we still our minds and our hearts before you, the almighty, sovereign, eternal God. We thank you for this, the Lord's Day. We thank you for the day that you have given to us for worship, for praise, and for fellowship. And we worship you and praise you, O Lord our God, for you are the Almighty God, the creator and sustainer of all things that are. We praise you for your might, majesty, and power. O Lord God, we thank you that you are the one who orders all things in accordance with your own wise counsel. We praise you not just for your majesty and might and power, but we praise you because you are the Holy One, the one before whom the very angels of God veil their faces, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth is full of his glory. We praise you for your mercy, grace, and love. Our loving Heavenly Father, we rejoice that in your great mercy and grace you sent your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to bear the penalty of the sins of your people. O oh Lord God, we rejoice. We rejoice in you as Father. We rejoice in Christ as Son. We rejoice in the Holy Spirit, the Comforter and the Counselor. Gracious God, be pleased to meet with us, we pray. We acknowledge our sin in your presence. We sin against you day and daily. There is nothing good within us by ourselves. But, O oh Lord God, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ we have forgiveness for our sins. And we pray that our worship might be found pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord our God, our worship is at best a, pu a poor thing, but we ask, O oh Lord, that you would sanctify our worship by the Holy Spirit, that it might prove pleasing in your sight. Be pleased to pour out of your Holy Spirit upon us, that this day we might know that it was good for us to be here, because here we met with the Lord. So meet with us, we pray. Be pleased to do us good. Pardon sin. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We read from the Word of God in the second book of Kings, the second book of Kings, chapter, uh, chapter 6, reading from verse 8. This is dealing with the ministry of Elisha, the prophet. Chapter 6, at verse 8. Once, when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Behold, uh, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself uh, there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he's in Dothan. 
So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those <clears throat> who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, uh, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. And we give thanks to God for this reading from his own word. Now, I want to say something uh, to the boys and girls. Now, this morning in our sermon, we're going to be looking at a psalm. We're going to be looking at Psalm 91. And in Psalm 91, it speaks about fiery darts or arrows. And that made me think. As you were told earlier, my wife and I spent a number of years as missionaries in Peru. And part of that time that we were in Peru, we lived in the jungle. And quite close to us were living quite a number of different tribes. Now, when, when the tribes want to have food, they don't go to the supermarket because there aren't any. They don't go to the shop, there aren't any. They have to go out and catch their own food. And one of the tribes near us caught their food. You now, here we have something. This is a quiver, and it's made out of palm leaves. And inside here, I hope, yes, inside here, there are arrows. Or well, not so much arrows, but darts. And you see the dark, the dark stuff on one end of these arrows? That's poison. And what they do is, in here, they have some <clears throat> cotton, and they put that on the end. I've got one wee arrow here to show you. They put it on here, and they wrap it all around, and they put it into a blowgun. And the blowgun is about nine or ten feet long. And they take this blowgun, and they catch their food. Some of the tribesmen could actually kill a monkey in a tree with these darts. See, these darts are poison darts. And it makes me think about the fiery darts of the wicked. You see, the Bible talks about the devil, and the Bible talks about how the devil tempts people. 
And in the New Testament, it says that we are, the, the devil uses his fiery darts into us. They're not like these. His fiery darts are temptation. He tempts us to do things that we shouldn't do. He tempts us to do things that are wrong. But they are just as dangerous as these poison darts. Because what the devil does is tempt us to do wrong, and that displeases God. So think about when we come to the sermon, and I'm talking about the darts of the, of the evil one, think about these darts that these tribes people use and the fiery darts of the wicked that causes you to sin against God. Now, I leave these things here. If you want to have a look at them later on, uh, then I'll leave them here and feel free to come and have a look at them. But I suggest you don't poke these into anybody. Uh, I think the poison is probably dead now for so many years, but uh, it'll be safer not to jab it into anybody. Now let's come before God once again in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness and your mercy. The mercy of the Lord is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you for your blessings to us in this past week. We thank you, Lord God, that you have provided for us all that we have needed. You have granted to us life. You have granted to us a measure of health and strength. You have granted to us homes and families. All that we have received, we have received in your goodness and your grace and your mercy. And, oh, Lord God, we thank you for this congregation. We thank you for the pastor and we pray for him. We ask for him as he ministers in South Africa. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bring him back safely uh, this week. We rejoice in his ministry here. We thank you for the elders. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that have work to do within this congregation. We thank you for the Holiday Bible Club that took place last week. And we thank you for the children that came. And we thank you for the parents that came on, on the last evening. And we pray that the messages that these boys and girls heard, the message that the parents heard, we ask, O oh Lord God, that it might bring forth fruit to the honor and glory of your name. Gracious God, we do pray for the young couple being married on Thursday. We pray your blessing upon them, and we pray that as they begin a life together, it may be a life together with Christ, that Christ may be at the center of their relationship and at the center of their home. Loving Heavenly Father, we do rejoice in your goodness. We rejoice in your blessings. We pray for those unable to meet with us today because of increased years or infirmity. O oh Lord God, bless them as they perhaps tune in to us online. And we pray, O oh Lord, that together with us they may receive the blessing of the Almighty God, that their hearts might be stirred within them. O oh Lord our God, without the blessing of the Lord, our meeting together here will be in vain. So draw near to us and bless us, we pray. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, we pray. Forgive our sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We worship God in the giving of tithes and offerings.
Turn with me, please, to the Old Testament Scriptures, to the book of the Psalms, and Psalm number 91. Psalm number 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, The Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me, in love I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And we finish our reading at the end of the psalm. And we trust that God will grant blessing on these public readings of his infallible and inerrant word. We again sing praise to God. Psalm number 16. Psalm 16. And we sing stanzas 4 to 8. The tune is St. Leonard, 149. Psalm 16 at verse 4. Of my inheritance and cup, the Lord's, the portion sure, and that which is my destiny, you will uphold secure. For unto me the boundary lines in pleasant places fell, and the inheritance I have in beauty does excel. Unless the Lord, I bless the Lord because he gives me counsel which is right. My heart within me he directs and teaches in the night. The Lord continually I've set before my face to see. Because he stands at my right hand, I never move will be. Because of this, my heart is glad. And joy will be expressed by all my glory. And my flesh in confidence will rest. We sing these verses 4 to 8. The tune is 149. Let's join together in praise to God.
it's almost certain that nobody has experienced times like we experienced between 2020 and 2022. No doubt many people will say that these couple of years have been terrible ones with all the restrictions, the problem of a worldwide pandemic. There are those who lost employment. Some have suffered sickness because of the virus. Some have experienced a loss of a loved one. And some have faced long periods of isolation. Many people working in the healthcare sector have been stretched almost to breaking point and have been pushed to their limits. It's not surprising that when people speak of these past couple of years, the most commonly used words are words like awful, terrible, disastrous, or just plain bad. And yet, for those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, 2020 to 2022 cannot really be described as bad years. Different years, certainly. Difficult years, perhaps. Years that have presented challenges and heartaches and not ones that we would care to repeat. But surely not bad years. For the Word of God tells us that God crowns the year with his goodness. Psalm 65, verse 11, you crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. So even in these most unusual of years, God has richly blessed us. He has given us life. The very breath we breathe comes from him. He has granted to us a measure of health and strength. He has provided food and shelter. And what is even more precious to the child of God, he has granted us his abiding presence and the assurance of sin forgiven through Christ. We have his inspired word in our hands, regular access to the throne of grace in prayer, and opportunities to worship together, even if that has been by electronic means. We have been taught many precious lessons as we have witnessed the chastening hand of the Lord on a self-centered, self-sufficient, and godless world. How can a year be a bad year? when we have received so much from the hand of our God. Sadly, we are all too prone to look at things and see them as the world sees them, rather than to have a divine perspective. With the help of God this morning, we're going to consider together a psalm that emphasizes where true happiness and blessing are to be found irrespective of prevailing circumstances, so that every year will be a good year. Psalm 91 is a psalm described by Martin Luther as the most distinguished jewel among all the psalms of consolation. Now there is much in this psalm that refers specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet what supremely refers to Christ also is true for his, his followers. This is a psalm that has to do with the confidence of faith. The first thing that we see in this psalm is the foundation of confidence. The foundation of confidence. People seek to find comfort and consolation in many different things, in many different places. Perhaps they're confident because they have good health, 
a steady job, sufficient wealth, and a stable family life. All of these things are, of course, good and desirable. But what happens when these things are not present? What happens when we lose some of these things? Many people began 2020 with some or all of these things. But as they look back over these past years, they have seen these things disappear. And the confidence with which they began the year has been eroded in the face of a seemingly unstoppable virus. The reality is that there can be no confidence, no comfort, no consolation that is not based truly and squarely on truth. Or to use another word, doctrine. Not the flexible truth of the politician, nor the changeable truth of the scientist, but the inflexible, unchanging truth of the living God. So what we have here is a great truth, a great truth. He that dwells in the secret place of the Almighty, communion with God brings security and safety. Communion with God, fellowship with God. But notice what it says. It says, he that dwells, he that lives, in the shadow of the Almighty. This is not a temporary or a passing thing. It's not something that comes with a weekly attendance at worship. It is living in the presence of God. It is he that dwells or lives in the secret place who will enjoy the shadow of the Almighty. It is knowing God. It is living with God and for God that gives us comfort and assurance and consolation. This is a great truth, and it's a great truth because God is almighty. He is sovereign. He is the ruler of all things. But it's a great truth because we are sinful. It's a great truth because sinful men and women, sinners by nature and by habitual practice, Yet, yet, even though the holy angels veil their faces in the presence of God, we, with all our sin, with all our wretchedness, we have access into the presence of God. Do we ever think what a tremendous privilege that is to come into the presence of the King of Kings to come into the presence of the one who has created all things, the one who sustains all things by his own mighty power. If we had an invitation to go and have lunch with Her Majesty the Queen, wouldn't we be excited? Wouldn't we be excited? Imagine, imagine, Her Majesty wants to have lunch with me. And yet we have access to the Almighty God. Do we sometimes forget what a privilege it is? Do we sometimes take that, that access for granted? And yet, what a privilege it is to come into the presence of the Almighty God. So it's a great truth. But there needs to be, in relation to this truth, there needs to be a personal appropriation of the truth. No matter how glorious the truth is, it means nothing if it's not a part of a personal experience. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, in him 
I will trust. You see, it's one thing to know that God is a refuge for his people, and it's a good thing to know. I know that it's a good thing to say, I know that people can find refuge in the Lord. I know that people can dwell in the secret place of the Most High. But it will do you no good whatsoever unless you do it for yourself. You see, the psalmist makes that very clear. Unless you can say with the, with the psalmist, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. In him I will trust. When things go wrong, when sickness comes, When unemployment comes, what is your refuge and your strength? When old age comes, when you can no longer do the things that you would like to do or things that once you did, what is your refuge and your strength? The psalmist could say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, in him I will trust. What a wonderful thing to know, not just as a great truth, but as a personal truth. You see, there's a personal challenge here. So the foundation of our confidence is a great truth, and it is an appropriated truth. But then the psalmist goes on, to talk about a sure deliverance. Surely, verse 3, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. What a wonderful message for these times. Deliverance from the perilous pestilence. Pestilence is another word for disease or uh, Perhaps we're more familiar with virus now. Now, when it says that he will deliver us from the deadly pestilence, it doesn't mean that believers will never catch this virus or some other virus or have some other sickness. We know that believers can catch the virus and be sick just as everyone else. We know that believers fall ill from many diseases and viruses. Believers die. But what trust in the Lord does is to deliver them from fear. It delivers them from the paralyzing fear that so many people have. It delivers them from the fear of the consequences of catching this virus or some other virus. You see, to be delivered from the fear of catching a virus is a great thing. But, the, 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 but to catch this virus or have some other illness for the believer should not be as chilling a prospect as it is for those who do not know God and have no hope. The Apostle, the Apostle Paul reminds us of the attitude that should be in all those who love the Lord. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Thus the knowledge that we dwell in the secret place of the Almighty takes away the fear of the pestilence and its consequences. Of course we take, in the midst of a pandemic or an epidemic, because there will almost certainly be another one at some stage in the future. We take all necessary precautions, but we know that even if we do catch it, we are still in his hands. We are still under his care. W.S. Plummer says in his commentary, epidemics have no power, but as they have a commission from God. Epidemics have no power, but as they have a commission for God. So we have this wonderful truth. 
this truth that can be appropriated, and we have the assurance of a safe deliverance. The second thing we look at is the firmness of our confidence in verses 4 to 13. The firmness of confidence. There is an abiding promise. There are some beautiful pictures of safety and security given in the fourth verse of this psalm. The protection that a mother bird gives to its chicks, hiding them from all danger underneath her wings. You see, the chicks have no idea that there's danger, but the mother knows. And so she brings her chicks in and covers them with her feathers, covers them with her wings. And so does the Lord for his people. He knows the dangers. He knows the dangers that we face every day. Sometimes we're not aware of the dangers that surround us. We're not aware of the devices of the devil, the way that he seeks to trap us and to trip us up. But God knows. And so just as that mother hen gathers her chicks, so the Lord cares for his people. He knows that his people do not have the wisdom or the power to deal with the danger, so he spreads his wings over them to hide them from danger. If the first picture is a picture of love and care, the second is of strength and protection. The defense afforded in battle by the shield. It was common amongst peoples fighting with sword and, and spear to form a defensive shield with the shields locked together to form a wall. This was seen perhaps more particularly in Roman times when they had their big uh, rectangular shields and they locked them together to form a wall, an impenetrable barrier against the swords and spears of their enemies. And this is the image that's given here. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Notice, his truth shall be your shield and buckler. So what truth is that? The truth that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The truth, as expressed by the Lord Jesus Christ, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will never leave you. It doesn't matter what danger you face. It doesn't matter what temptation comes to you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. There is never a moment in our lives when the Lord Jesus Christ does not care for us and is not with us. And it is these truths that we have in the Word of God. And these are the things that protect the child of God, for they are promises made by a sovereign God who cannot lie. There's the verse in Psalm 23 that we're all familiar with. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And you can put all sorts of circumstances into that rather than the valley of the shadow of death. No matter where I go, I will not fear because you are with me. And there is an almighty power. The power that guards and protects the child of God is all-powerful. And that always takes away the fear of believers, as the psalmist recognizes in verse 5. You shall not be afraid. C.H. Spurgeon puts it well when he says this. 
not to be afraid is in itself an unspeakable blessing, since for every suffering which we endure from real injury, we are tormented by a thousand griefs which arise from fear only. That's a good quote from Spurgeon. He promises to deal with our fear. And this almighty power of God operates day and night. He is the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps. And for some, the nighttime brings fears and alarms. During the night when everything is silent and dark, the mind can range far and wide and alarm us with many terrors. The devil may bring to our minds in these dark night hours, the devil may bring to our minds even those sins which have been confessed, which have been forgiven, and yet he reminds us of them and he torments us with them. So there is the calming word of the Lord. Do not be afraid. I am the God who watches over you during the hours of darkness. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. So when our minds go into all sorts of places during the night, be assured that he, our God, watches over you. And what about the arrow that flies by day? The fiery darts of the wicked are constantly aimed at the righteous, and the Christian is often unaware of them. From how many unknown dangers does the Lord protect and preserve his people? There's a wonderful illustration of this in 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, the chapter we read together. When a great army surrounded the, uh, the city of Dothan in an attempt to capture the prophet Elisha, when Elisha's servant saw the army, his heart failed him for fear. But Elisha said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. There are so many dangers that surround us of which we are unaware, but from which our God protects and defends us. And the care and protection that God gives to his people is both physical and spiritual. He gives, in verse 10, spiritual strength. The verse tells us that no evil will befall his people. They may be weary. They may be weak in body. They may battle with various trials. They may be lonely. But the promise of God is that he will not allow evil to overcome them. He will keep those souls committed to him. And then there is the all-sufficient provision and protection that he gives in verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Now we know that this verse particularly applies to the Lord Jesus Christ in his wilderness temptations. But what was supremely true of Christ is also true of his people. Isn't it a wonderful thing to think that God charges his spirit beings to keep God's people in all their ways. The truth of the matter is that the child of God is invincible until the time of God's calling. God calls us to him when it pleases him, and until that time, God keeps us in all our ways. So there is an abiding promise backed up by an almighty power that gives an all-round protection. The third thing, the fruit of confidence. The fruit of confidence. Humble dependence upon God brings with it certain great and glorious 
promises. But the first thing we need to note is that the people to whom these promises are made. This is, these are not indiscriminate promises made to anybody and everybody, but to a particular, specific people. They are described like this. They are those who know God's name, who know him. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. What we have here, therefore, is the need, if we wish to, to, dwell, in, uh, to dwell in the shelter of the Most High, the first and most important thing is that we know him, that we are born again of the Spirit of God. Because without that, we have no guarantee of his promises. What we have here, therefore, is the need for a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to address a couple of words to the young people in the congregation. The faith of your father and mother will not do for you. The fact that they know the Lord, the fact that they have a personal trust and faith in the Lord is not enough for you. You need to have a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself. You need to know him for yourself. Not to know about him. Not to know the things that you learn in Sabbath school. Not the things you, you learn about from your, from your mother and father. You need to know him, the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to know a lot of theology to understand, or, or to understand everything that's in the Bible. If you needed that, none of us would be saved. All you need is to acknowledge your sin, to seek to turn from it, and to seek forgiveness and ask him to be your savior. It's very important, very important. There's nothing more important in your life than this, to know the Lord. But not only those who know God's name, those who love him. Now you would think those two things would be synonymous, wouldn't you? To know him and to love him. But could it be that we profess to know him and to love him, but our love has grown cold? We do not love him as once we did. We don't love him now as much as we did when we first came to faith in Christ. Do we long to be in his presence as once we did? Or have we become like those believers in Laodicea, lukewarm? You see, these promises, the fruit of confidence, comes to those who know him and to those who love him. We are to love him with heart and soul and mind and strength. Does your heart burn with joy when you're in his presence? But we need to know him. We need to love him. But there's something else here. Those who call on his name, those who call on his name, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver those that know me, those that love me, and those that call on my name. There's a great challenge here for all of us. We say that we know him. We say that we love him. But do we call on his name as much as we should? Do we spend time waiting upon God? It's always rather distressing that the 
the worst attended meeting in almost every church is the meeting for prayer. I wonder why that should be. After all, if we know him, if we love him, we should want to be in his presence and we should want to call on his name. So the fruit of confidence is for those who know him, those who love him, and those who call on his name. Finally, we consider the promises that are made. We've looked at those to whom the promises are made, those who love him, uh, those who know him, who love him and call on his name. And so what are these promises? Deliverance from trouble and his presence in trouble. Now, God does not always deliver his people from trouble. We only have to read the scriptures to know that. Many of God's people go through times of trial, difficult and trouble, anxiety and confusion. We only have to think of, in our own history of our covenanting forefathers and how much they suffered. God's people have found themselves in trouble. But the testimony of the martyrs for Christ has been that God was with them in the midst of their trouble. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, in Daniel. You see, they had it right. When they, were when they were faced with being thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, they said this, Our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and from your hand, O King. But if not, we will not bow down to your idol. God is able to deliver us. They had that confidence. Now, God did not deliver them from the furnace. They were thrown into that furnace that was so hot that it killed the people that threw them in. And yet, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But God was with them in the furnace. You remember how they said, look, we, did we not throw three men into the furnace, bound? And there are four people there, four men, loosed, walking about in the midst of the fire. We believe it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself who was walking with them. But the presence of God was with them in trouble. And he has promised that he would be with us in trouble. Sometimes he delivers us from trouble, sometimes in trouble, and sometimes through trouble. But he has promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us. We cannot expect as believers to be preserved from all danger and all difficulty and all trouble. But we can be assured of one thing. God will be with us in our trouble. He may deliver us from it. He may bring us through it. But we will not face it alone. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you will be with me. So that's one promise he makes. But then he promises answered prayer. Sometimes I think we misunderstand what is meant by these words. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And think that everything that we ask for will be granted. But God can answer our prayers with yes, no, or not yet. The answer may not be what we desire. But God knows better than we do what is best for us. Isn't that the case with parents? Sometimes our children ask us for something, we say no. No, it's not good for you. We may say, no, not yet, you're not old enough. But when you're older, then yes. And God does exactly the same thing with us. He sometimes says yes. He sometimes says no. He sometimes says, not yet. 
But perhaps we don't have because we don't ask. Perhaps we don't ask long enough. We're not, we don't persevere in prayer as we should. Perhaps we don't wait patiently enough for God to answer our prayers. Do we expect an answer to our prayers? I was greatly challenged not long after I became a Christian. A man who greatly influenced me, he showed me what he did with his prayers. He had a book and he had columns in the book. And he wrote down the date and then he wrote down his prayer requests. And then in the other column, he had the date when the prayer was answered. I've never dared to do that. Perhaps because I don't really expect an answer to my prayer. But we should. We should expect an answer to the prayers that we make. He shall call upon me and I will answer him, he says. And then thirdly, there is satisfaction in this life. Is not one of the curses of this present age dissatisfaction? People are always searching for something better or newer. Millions play the weekly lottery because they are dissatisfied with their present life and a win on the lottery would make life so much better, they think. But it shouldn't be that way for the child of God. The New Testament makes it quite clear in 1 Timothy 6 and 6 that godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Christians ought to be content. If we dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, in the shelter of the Most High, in the shadow of the Almighty, then we will be content because we will have everything that we need. He promises to give us our daily bread. He promises to be with us. And if he is with us, what more? What more do we need? And the final thing he promises us is glory in the world to come. I will show him my salvation. We know something of God's salvation now, when we're born again of the Spirit of God. But we know this part of the salvation encased, en encased as we are in a mortal body, troubled every day with sin, and uncleanness. But one day, one day we shall see him as he is. One day we shall be changed into his likeness. We shall see him face to face and we shall be changed into his likeness. Done away with will be all the sin, all the wickedness, all the, all the doubt and all the fear. So God promises to deliver us from trouble and in trouble. He promises to answer our prayers, to make us content in this world, and to bring us to everlasting glory when we shall see his face and rejoice in his presence. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of of the Almighty. May God in his mercy enable us to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Amen. We bring our worship to a close as we sing from Psalm 91. It's singing the A version of the psalm. We sing verses 1 and 2 and verses 10 to 12.
The tune is Woodworth, number 39. Psalm 91, A, the A version of the psalm, and we sing verses 1 and 2. The man who in the sheltered place of the Most High dwells by his grace will with Almighty God abide and in his shadow safely hide. I therefore to the Lord will say, He is my refuge, my sure stay, my citadel of strength is he, my God in whom my trust will be. And then we go down to verse 10. Because he set his love on me from danger, I will set him free. Because to him my name is known, on high I'll set him as my own. And when on me this man will call, then unto him I answer will. I will be with him in distress. I'll rescue him, and him I'll bless. And to him honour give will I, with length of days him satisfy. And my salvation him I'll show, so that he may, so that he may it truly know. Psalm 91a, 1 and 2 and 10 to 12, the tune number 39. Let's join together in praise to God. <clears throat> I receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.